everybody here tonight. This is our fourth monthly educational meeting, so I hope you're all having fun with it if you've been here before, and if not, I hope you learn a little bit tonight and tell all your friends that uh, it was great to come by. Um, I wanted to thank our caterer, Kelly and Kendall Galore at Potty Do uh, Catering, and Debbie Fisher also brought the cheesecake tonight, so I hope you all get a little piece of that because that's all very delicious and we appreciate um, what they do. So I see a lot of familiar faces here, but those of you that might not know me, my name is uh, Leslie Schur. I'm a veterinarian here at Desert Pines Equine and have been since the inception. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about your mare's delivery of a foal um, and the first couple days maybe of that foal's life and, and what to expect. It's a pretty broad subject, so we won't have time to touch on absolutely everything, but I would love to entertain questions. If you have a specific question, I'm certainly, we want to make this an interactive meeting tonight, so I'm certainly um, happy to answer any of those questions. So we're just going to start at the beginning here tonight. Um, so we all start this venture with this dream of having our mayor be a mom, and over the past what, 20, 25 years, that um, dream has opened up a lot because it's almost like online dating, right? We can breed our mare to any stud in any country or any part of our country um, that we want to. So it's pretty exciting because we've been able to produce some amazing animals where maybe coast to coast might have been a challenge or overseas or Canada might have been a real challenge way back when. And it's not that much of a challenge anymore. So you've studied all the studs, you've selected who's going to be the perfect dad for, for your mare, and you're thinking into the future of what an amazing cutting horse, jumping horse, barrel horse, pleasure horse you're going to have, and you've already planned that future. So we're going to just help to get you a little bit more educated so we can get the full here safely on the ground, make you aware of some of the things that can go wrong. Thank goodness in equine deliveries, 90% of them are uncomplicated, but the 10% that are complicated can be very, very life-threatening. So we're going to just try and make you aware of some of those situations. So in, I always like to start out with the breeding side of things when we have this illustrious dream and what we're going to do with our mare. And remember, just like in the human side, uh, conception is a gift. It's not a given. Um, and Dr. Lamb is going to present next month in our educational um, series about getting your mare in foal. So he's going to touch on those. I'm not going to touch on it, but just want to make everybody aware of that. So if you do have a pregnant mare coming along, yeah, you've been very blessed because they don't always get pregnant. So this is just a picture of where we go from. The, the picture on the left is actually an ovary. So that big black circle um, has an egg inside of it. And a mare through her estrus cycle, that, uh, that follicle will grow and then become the dominant follicle. When the hormones change, the black hole will rupture, shoot off an egg. And if we're lucky enough, the semen that's in the mare finds the egg. And on the right at 13 days, this little tiny dot is your baby. So that's exciting, that little black circle there, and you see the little white, um, I have a pointer, uh, sorry. <laughs> the little white things at the top and the bottom, we call those specular echoes, and that's where we're starting to have some dividing of cells. We like to check these mares very early. Anybody know why? Twins, right? So twins don't do well in horses. And unless we're flushing embryos out of them at seven days, we don't ever want to wish a twin. And so there's some things we can do to help follow those along or possibly eliminate one twin so we can actually have a surviving foal. When we get too far down the road, um, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. So, so I just thought this was the coolest picture. Maybe some of you guys have seen this before online, but... That's um, a, a picture of a fetus, and I think it was, I think it said 65 days. I thought it was just an amazing, amazing picture. There's some of that data there, too. Yeah, afterwards, we actually have a couple-month-old fetus and a two-month and a three-and-a-half-month-old fetus. Um, everybody always likes me to ask, ask me what happened there. The two-month-old um, was a mare that got into some toxins. She aborted the fetus. She was fine. 
unfortunately, the second one, um, the mare was a colic and had passed away. So that's what those are. But it just gives you an idea of we want to feed our um, feed our mares a whole bunch of extra food. And at a uh, couple months of age, that little baby in there is all it is. So you're welcome to come up and take a peek at these um, afterwards as well. So gestation in a mare it can be variable, but usually around 340 days, which is 11 months um, and one week. We have had normal foals as early as 320 days, and we've had some mares go over a year. So it can be a little bit of variability in that. So the countdown, right? We're getting pretty close to having foaling season upon us right now. We expect to probably see our first babies in the next couple weeks here. So one month prior to your baby coming on the ground, we like to see those mares um, for a couple of reasons. One, we like to vaccinate them for the full series of vaccinations one month prior to foaling because when they deliver that foal, the first milk that that baby drinks helps to raise their immunity and they depend upon that. And if they've been vaccinated very recently, then it's going to be very high in antibodies to those diseases. So it's almost like vaccinating your foal on day one by uh, vaccinating the mare a month out. Um, some mares may have had a little bit of problem with a uterine infection or they may have poor vulvular conformation, meaning unfortunately mares defecate right over the top of their vulva and if they tilt or aren't quite right, sometimes we'll actually sew the top of that vulva down. Um, it's a very thin strip of tissue. They still urinate out the bottom of it. Um, but if for some reason this paper thin little piece of tissue that we sew up is not opened, they will not rip it. They will rip right alongside of it, all in their normal vulva. So if you have gotten a pregnant mare and you actually don't know if she has a Caslix, you definitely will want to have her seen and make sure um, that she doesn't and that that's opened up prior to foaling. So the mare may likely start to bag up um, two to four weeks before foaling and it'll always be a little bit variable. These maiden mares or these first time mamas are always a little bit different. So we can talk about all of these things and all of the different deals we're gonna do to predict when that baby's gonna come and sometimes they have the mind of their own and they don't listen to any of them. So I'm gonna give you the, the, the majority but sometimes there's a little bit different. So ventral edema, that's um, as they start to build those mammary glands, because of the way the horse stands, there's a whole lot more blood supply going back to their mammary gland. And sometimes it's hard for all of that blood supply to return up the belly. So they'll actually get kind of this big swollen belly on the bottom. It may look like they've got a little um, sandbox on their belly. And that's what it feels like, almost like Play-Doh or, or one of those little sandboxes you can dent your fingers in and out of. And that's edema. And it's very normal. Um, some mares will get very uncomfortable. They'll get huge. Some just get a little bit. Some get huge. And it can actually get so bad in some mares that they can have a problem with rupturing the tendon that holds all their muscles in their abdomen. Very rare, but it's possible. So the other thing that will happen is their croup right over the top of their bum there uh, around their tail head and their vulva is going to get kind of soft and jello-y. Everything's kind of relaxing back there as the hormones change. So it facilitates the delivery of this giant foal. So this is just a picture here. Back to that pointer thing again. You see how this mare has this swelling on her belly, how it hangs down? Um, that's all edema. She might even end up with it between her front legs. She'll look like she has a little brick of tissue there between her front legs and that's all of that edema as it accumulates on her abdomen. And even though horses don't look like it, they're a little shorter in the front than they are in the back, so they'll always end up between their front legs as well. So this is what waxing up looks like. As mares get a big, full um, bag, They'll let a little bit of that first milk, that colostrum, kind of leak out a little bit and it'll look just like candle wax on the end of their nipples. And that usually happens within 48 hours of having that baby. So it's one of those heads up, baby's getting close when we see that. Will absolutely every mare wax up? No, not all of them do. So again, we're kind of going with the majority. But I don't want y'all going home and saying, oh my God, my mare folded. I, Dr. Sure told me she was going to wax up first because <laughs> sometimes they don't. So. 
So what if you see this? What's happening here? This mare is leaking or streaming milk. That can be a problem because they only have so much of that first milk, that really vital antibody high milk that's going to help protect those foals. And if they're streaming milk out for days, they've lost it all. And now the baby's born and doesn't have any colostrum. And their cellular immunity, their part of their body that helps to fight infection is not very well developed yet. So they really depend on what we call humoral immunity or the antibodies that they're able to have. And they get those from mom. If they don't have any, they're like a little AIDS child being born on day one. They don't have any and it's a bad deal. So if for some reason your mare is leaking milk, you should start catching it. Um, and then when we're gonna get later in our talk, we're gonna talk about when we examine those foals. If she leaked out milk, and we've caught it, or she leaked out milk and we didn't catch it, we need to see those babies earlier because we need to get something in their bellies that's high in that antibody level and avoid a plasma transfusion or what we call a failure of passive transfer where the baby doesn't have any antibodies or a very low level. So it's very important to know <coughs> if the mare was streaming milk prior to delivery. Very common for them um, the afternoon or evening of to start to release some milk but we never know if that's what's happening or not. So I'd still say if you're seeing it for more than a couple hours, you need to start, start catching some. So we're closed, she's waxed up. Um, we've got that softening of the croup in the vulva. And there are a few other things we can do to help predict um, if that foal's coming. There are some simple commercially available <coughs> kits. There's a bunch of them out there. Predict the foal um, is a pretty easy kit to use. Um, Dr. Lamb and myself were able to use it, so that means that it's pretty straightforward. We had one years ago and we pulled it out and we were going to test a foal we or a mare we had in the clinic and we couldn't do it. So we were. <laughs> We said, if we can't have problems figuring this out, we probably can't expect our clients to. This one's really simple. Um, so we like this. Now, it gives you a percentage um, a probability that the mare is going to fold within 12 hours. And some, again, don't play by the rules. So I've had people say, oh my god, this thing says it has a 95% of probability for the last two weeks. So yeah. what, when is she going to fold? Um, and so it's not 100%, but, but they're relatively accurate. And it'll measure the electrolytes and the minerals in the milk that help determine when they're going to get close. One of the very, very simple things that, you, that I've always noticed as well is when you're just testing that milk, and you see it kind of as a creamy yellow color. That's usually what that colostrum is and, and that early kind of waxy stuff is. The night that you go and test the milk and it's white, you're probably going to fold. So it's, it's making the switch at that point. It's a very simple minded way to test. So how are we going to, where are we going to fold her? It'd be beautiful if we had a nice green pasture, but most of us don't have that situation here nor I don't know that it would be the best in, in the desert with our winds and that. So we want to make sure the stall is big enough. Probably a 12 by 12 stall, unless you're folding out a mini, um, is not ideal. You'd like to have something a little bit bigger. 16 by 16, 20 by 20 is great, just so the mare doesn't um, invariably fold into the wall and, and have problems. A lot of us here have corrals, right? Just some outside pens. And one of the things I would stress to you is you need to have something up around the outside of the pen, not six feet in the air, but probably the lower three or four feet. And that's, there's two reasons. One, you need to keep the foal in. And invariably foals will roll and get under a fence and get up on the other side. Mom freaks out, foals not nursing, we're called the next morning for a big old wreck. And it happens all the time. The second thing is, I don't care how sweet your dog is, um, dogs get in and sometimes they're not used to, to foals and they don't know what to do with them and, and certainly um, probably every other year we have a, a dog attack and somebody loses a foal. So whether it be yours or the neighbors or something wanders in so it's nice to just have the fence high enough that the dog likely cannot get in there with the foal. And cameras are amazing and so easy now. Um, anything from a baby monitor that you can put in there to we have these great things here at the clinic that I just pop up my little DVR on my iPhone when I'm home when I need to check a horse that's in the, 
in our ICU. And, and you can do the same things at home, and they're, they're relatively inexpensive um, on the big scale of things if you think about losing a foal, um, being able to put one of those little cameras up in your, in your barn. So they're sure fun to have too. But you have to wake up in order to look at the camera. <laughs> They do have some other things too that you can put on. There's some foaling monitors that you can sew actually into a mare's vulva. When their vulvar lips kind of open, the alarm goes off and it will page you, call you, do whatever you want it to do. And it goes down through a list. Um, the same thing, they have these little halters that you have around their um, chest. It goes up, it looks like almost like a vaulting collar that the vaulters use. And when they lay down, same thing, it'll call you, page you. Um, there's a lot of false alarms because those mares lay down and sometimes there's so much pressure on their abdomen, they'll go off. Um, but always better safe than sorry because things can happen quickly. So how to prepare. Your, your watch is probably your best friend because they're not a cow, they're not a person. Horses get in trouble fast. So when there's a problem, you need to... <coughs> look at it and call right away. And what we always recommend is if things are not progressing or you think something's not right, please call immediately because there's always going to be a lag time until you get through to us. And I can't tell you the number of times in the middle of the night I've been sitting on the edge of my bed putting my, putting my boots on and talking to the client as I go, getting in the truck and going, okay, it's on the ground, not great, we'll see you in the morning. And <laughs> back in the house. But I would rather be on the phone with you and talking to you and know that everything's okay than you saying, well, it was three o'clock in the morning, I really didn't want to call, and now we've actually lost a foal. So we hate losing foals as, as much as you guys do. So if there's a question, call. You will never have a problem with that. Um, so have your veterinarian's numbers. And then something else people don't think about. Do you have a trailer if there's an emergency? When horses have a difficult birth or a dystocia, we will manipulate so long in the field. And then if we have to continually because nobody has a trailer available, we will. But if sometimes we have to anesthetize a horse or do an epidural or do some other things to facilitate it, um, and we don't like doing that in the field because it's, it's more difficult. It's hard to have our team organized all together at once. Um, and, and we have a facility. We can put them in the surgery room. We can elevate their hind end. We can do some things to help us deliver that baby. So in a situation where we're in a critical time where we're looking at our clock and going, gosh, we're an hour out and I don't have this full out, we're starting to risk losing it. Um, <coughs> if you say, I've got my trailer hooked up, guess what, that, that horse is gonna go to the clinic quickly. That all depends where you live, T. We look at that as well. <laughs> so little things to have set aside at home. Um, a bucket, because once the mare passes her placenta, we're gonna want you to pick that placenta up and put it in a bucket. That's an important part of the whole delivery process, something we're gonna look at and make sure the mare is passed completely afterwards. Um, navel dip, which is a diluted Novasan or chlorhexidine, um, where we like to dip those navels. So I know historically a lot of people have thought, well, we dip the navel in iodine and or betadine. But there have been studies done over the past 10 years that show that chlorhexidine on a frequent basis, back-to-back um, -back days, is more effective. And the reason being, in a human side of things, they often use, I think, iodine on, on children's um, belly buttons, but babies are born in a more sterile environment than horses are. So we have these open tubes, those are your vessels, right? Your arteries and your veins that snap away when the umbilicus is pulled off. They're open and they're, they're fold in the dirt or the straw or the shavings or whatever you got them on. There's definitely some contamination. And if we cauterize that with a straight iodine, now any bacteria that was in there, we just locked inside. And so that's why we prefer to do the chlorhexidine because it's a, a continual disinfectant. We just have you put a little mayonnaise jar, a little cap to a syringe, dip their little belly button three, four times a day for the first couple days of life. And we found that's a little more effective. And you said the Novasan works too? Yeah, Novasan is chlorhexidine. Okay, chlorhexidine is the ratio, is that a one to three? Four, four to one. Four to one. Mm -hmm. Four parts water to one part. And we find that if you do it with distilled water, it lasts better. Normal tap water kind so of sediments out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then dry towels, if you need to stimulate that foal or dry it off, if the weather's kind of chilly, you can use those as well. So. I thought this mare epitomized the view of a pregnant mama. 
and she looks relatively happy, doesn't she? I don't know that I would be, but <laughs> I think she is ready to have this baby. So let's talk about stage one. So stage one can be a little confusing, right? Because these mares are starting to get crampy. What's happening is the uterus is contracting and it's pushing the fetus into the cervix. Um, but the mares will just act a little anxious, a little crampy, maybe up and down, a little sweaty. Um, and those can also be signs of a colic, right? So just because they're at a full due date, if that's persisting and persisting, we should at least get a phone call and let's visit about it. The other thing is that mares, sometimes we get a mare that is a little bit more crampy than another one and she hurts more. And this can go on for weeks. So I've had people for weeks and weeks just call and we've had to go see them and we check them and then they do it again. And I'll tell you a little funny story. A good friend of mine had a mare just like that and it went on for probably three weeks. And I, I probably in that first three weeks went, I don't know, three or four times to see the mare. And never was she foaling. She was just crampy and uncomfortable. And everything was fine. We'd ultrasounded her, we checked it. The fetal heart rate was great. The cervix was still closed. Um, and so I was just driving home one day and I was visiting with her on the phone and, and she told me, yeah, she was still at it. And I said, well, I'm just gonna stop by. She's like, I am not paying you another dime to stop by. <laughs> don't come by here. I don't, I'm like, no, I just had something to drop off. I'm just gonna come by. She says, oh, okay. So we come by and uh, we're in the barn aisle and I'm visiting with her and I'm watching her and she is back at it again. And she's like, her husband's like, she just keeps peeing all over the place. I'm like, oh, huh. I don't think that's pee, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, she had broke her water, and just by happenstance, I happened to stop by, and she actually had a leg back when I was there, so it ended up being an assisted delivery. Um, so, you know, those things can be tricky, because some of those mares will just be crampy, but I tell you never to discount it. Um, we had a nightmare case last year that was a mare that was a dystocia. She had, um, she presented in labor, but very painful and very uncomfortable. And she had her, um, her membranes present at the vulva and I manipulated her a bit and I, I finally said, you know, we're not gonna get it here. We threw the mare in a trailer, we brought her to the clinic um, and we manipulated her some more. We couldn't get it, we took her in for a C-section. And as we opened her abdomen, her colon was massively gas distended. And this poor mare, not only did she have a dystocia and have a problem with delivery, but she'd actually twisted her colon. And it was, it was a nightmare. I'd never seen that in, in all the years. But so we can't always discount the pain. Mares do it, yes. Mares get painful. Sometimes it goes on for a long time. But I don't think we should ever just ignore it and say everything's okay, because it's not always okay. So this stage one of labor, that anxious, kind of uncomfortable up and down, um, those horses can do this for a couple hours, or if you have one of those other ones, maybe a couple weeks. Um, so that foal is moving into the cervix, and you may see the membranes, those white or, uh, membranes start to come at the end of stage one. Because the end of stage one and the beginning of stage two is when the water breaks. And it's not always quite as remarkable as we think. It doesn't always come that way. Sometimes you think the horse is urinating. Sometimes you get this darker fluid that um, you just see coming from the mare's vulva. So the mare will start to um, have some issues lying down, maybe a little bit of an abdominal press, and you'll probably see a little bit of this amniotic fluid start to come out. And you'll see a little bit of um, sweating often too. Delivering these babies is not easy. So this is just a, a view of the mare passing a little amniotic fluid off of there. So stage begins with the abrupt uh, rupture of those membranes. But again, like we talked about, it's not always quite as spectacular as, as we would think. You may see that dark fluid kind of come out. Um, and then you may see the, the membrane. So if you've ever seen a full born, and if you haven't, you're gonna in a minute here, um, you may see those white membranes kind of present at the vulva. The, the baby is going to have its membranes over its nose and its head. You don't have to get in there and rip those off. It's still attached by its umbilicus, still to the placenta, so it's still getting oxygen up through the blood that's coming into its umbilical cord. 
okay? There's one exception where you may need to get in there, and we're going to talk about that next. Um, so again, we're watching our clock, right? The water broke at 6.05. Um, how fast are we going? She's pressing, pressing, pressing. It's 6.20. What do you do? You don't see anything. Yes. <laughs> Call. And if all you do is hang up and go, okay, got, great, sorry, the, the baby's out, then that's fine. But we would rather you call. Um, in our practice, we have an agreement among the veterinarians, whoever, this is one of the very few, whoever is closest goes. Because there's very few times in veterinary medicine um, that minutes make the difference between life and death. And this would be one of them. So... Um, if 15 minutes have gone by and you're not seeing anything or you only see one leg or you only see a head, um, call. Um, so this is a picture here up top of what you would see as they start to deliver. I hope you guys can all see it, but it's kind of this white filmy membranes that's over the top. That's those coriolantois. That's what the normal fetal membranes that should be covering that foal. So it's in this like double ball sac, right? The, the outside sac is the placenta. That's what this red ball is right here. This is what we call a red bag delivery or a placenta previa. The placenta has prematurely let go from the uterus and it hasn't ruptured. There has been no water broken here yet because they were supposed to poke a hole in this thing on their own as they come through. If you see this, this is something you don't wait. It needs to be opened immediately because the foal is going to suffocate and die. Um, because now the placenta has let go from the uterus. There's not the normal oxygen load that should be going up into the foal's blood. It can't breathe because it's inside with a bunch of membranes and fluids all over it. This is uh, an emergency, what we call a red bag delivery. This next one might show it a little bit better. Um, this is just, it'll look just kind of this red velvety looking bag that's coming out. It's pretty tough. I mean, I don't think we want you to take a huge knife to it, but you may have to get really kind of stab it um, through the end in order to get open, get a little hole, get your fingers in there and rip it. From there, you just leave them alone. Um, they will then present those, a bunch of fluids, so you're probably going to get wet if you have to do this. It's pretty stinky. Um, but then you're going to have those fetal membranes and things come through there. This foal will die if it's not opened. I have had mares foal um, quickly with a red bag, meaning I'm going to push, I'm going to push. Owner sitting there, crap, I have to open that. And pretty soon, there's this gigantic red bag. It's born in the placenta. And they really get it out because everything's let go and the foal's going to die in there pretty quickly. So you got to get it open. Don't wait, don't call, get it open. Well, call, but after you get it open. <laughs> so this just goes over um, some positioning of the foal as it comes through the pelvic canal. And often we'll get people come in and want to know, is that baby in the right position? Well, babies turn as they're delivered. We're going to have a slide here in a minute that kind of show, show us. So when we palpate the uterus a day out or so, we can't tell if the foal is going to be exactly perfectly right because it's still going to go through some changes. If we got butt first, that's a problem. But um, things change as they deliver. But in a, a normal uh, delivery, you're going to have one leg a little bit in front of the other and a nose jutted out straight. So this is just a schematic of what's happening here. Um, this is experimental when they gave some oxytocin, which is the hormone that makes the uterus contract of what happens um, with the baby. So this is if you're standing on top of that baby looking down at it here, okay? So it's actually upside down, right? So 13 minutes after the first dose of oxytocin, the baby's head goes under and the legs go out and then it starts to give a little bit of a twist. It turns, so now we've got a head forward and the legs coming forward but the back end still upside down. That's at 21 minutes. Then three minutes later, the back end takes a turn. Another minute, the back legs go out straight, and now we're kind of in our normal position. But that's what happens during delivery, is that oxytocin level goes higher. That foal takes its little twists and turns and gets into where it needs to be. Um, so this is looking from, if you're standing on the left side of the mare, so the mare's head up here, and you're looking here, the 
Jaime's out this way. So that's just showing you the, the same thing again, the way that the foal turns and uh, positions up for delivery. <coughs> so stage two now. We broke our water. We were in an active abdominal press. We've got a baby's nose right here. We see two feet and they're pointed down. That's good news. That's good news. Mom's pushing and trying to deliver that foal. Do we need to get in there and rush and pull it? No. Mom takes care of things pretty good on her own as long as they're progressing. So the little closer up picture, you can see the head coming out and the um, two feet split. And that way, that, what that does is kind of splits the size of the shoulders. Instead of being like this coming through with both of its shoulders, it gets a little smaller. It fits through mom a little easier that way. Um, again, these membranes are okay over the baby. You don't need to rush in and get those off. It's still attached, so we're okay. It's hard to resist, though. <laughs> so this is his baby comes through. He's broke his own way through those membranes. So he's wondering what's up with this new world, and it's kind of cold out here. <laughs> and as we pass, now we can see... You can see the placenta here. It's attached still up within the mare. And the foal is just trying to ride itself and figure out what's up in the new world. So congratulations, Mom. We've just delivered a baby. And we are now at the end of stage two of labor. And there's actually three stages of labor. Yes, Dr. Lamb. I didn't hear you mention it, but just in that... Oh yeah, I messed that up there. Good idea. Thank you. Um, so, a couple reasons you see straw in this stall. It's better to fold out on straw. I know it's messy to clean. It's not as easy. But there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's very common to have problems with shavings getting in foals' eyes and having corneal ulcers and problems that way. Um, again, it's it's more focal um, moisture in that too if the foal ends up in a soiled area this kind of spreads out a little bit more and then as they get a little bit older um, the foals love to eat shavings and we've had more than one foal on the surgery table with a colon impaction because of shavings so they don't seem to you know until they're old enough to digest don't eat the straw as well also better um, for the respiratory system shavings are a little bit dusty and they'll inhale some of that stuff. So straws ideal. Uh, one more thing, when that light membrane line bears out, they fold, they'll stand up, and they can actually pull that back up in. You have shavings hooked to it. Got, shavings are a lot easier for her to pull it up into the vaginal cavity into the uterus, follow the pull it Right, so a that. A lot of them just pass their after birth right when they fold it. A lot of them don't, they stand up and take their shavings back. Good point. So, quiz time. <coughs> so, who breaks the umbilical cord on the foal? A, your trusted veterinarian. B, the mare. C, you acting as the on-site midwife. D, the foal. Or E, either E, oh, sorry, B or D. <laughs> e? Okay, E is either the mare or the foal, and ding, 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 you are So the cord is attached to that big old placenta, right? That's all the vessels that go inside that baby and feed it during um, its development in utero. So they're elastic little tubes called blood vessels. And when it is stretched, it springs back like a rubber band and closes up a little bit. Um, and so it depends on who's first to get up, who moves the most. If mom gets up, she's going to rip the cord off. If baby gets up, it might rip the cord off the placenta. So it can go either way. Um, you know, and I've also seen those babies, the poor little guys, they get the um, membranes hooked around their back and they're trying to get up and it's like spring loaded to their cord. They can't, they can't get there. So sometimes mom has to get up and break that and help them to get going. 
So you are all correct. That's very good. E. So labor of stage three, we're not totally done. We've delivered a miracle little child here on the ground, but she's got this little deal still hanging back here between her hind legs called the placenta. And I think the placenta has to be one of the most amazing organs there ever is. And it facilitated the development of these foals. So it's the expulsion of the fetal membranes or passing of the placenta. Um, we don't want the mare to step on it, okay? Because we leave part of the placenta in the mare, she's really sensitive and she's gonna get sick. She's gonna get toxic. We're gonna end up having to flush her uterus and put her on antibiotics and hope she's gonna be okay. So we don't want her to rip part of it off. We want to be able to look at this when we come out to examine your foal and know that it's all been passed. Um, so if you see it hanging like this, uh, you can tie it up in a knot. Just grab some gloves or if you're tough, you don't need a nut, gloves. Tie it up in a knot. Sometimes we'll put a little baling twine or a rubber band around it. We just don't want her to step on it, okay? Um, so it helps to protect it because we want to see that. Um, this is a mare that's passing her placenta um, right after delivery or when she's gotten down and gotten crampy. So after mares foal, they still are a little crampy and some of them really hurt. I mean, some will get down and roll and be uncomfortable and often that can just be from, from uterine contractions and as the uterus contracts, it helps to push the placenta out. Um, one of the things that happens is when the foal goes to nurse, it's an amazing little reflex, but when the foal nurses, there's that hormone of oxytocin again, which allows more milk let down for that foal, but it also makes the uterus contract. So every time the foal nurses, oh, it hurts. And so sometimes that's tough for these new mares because they don't understand. All they know is they hurt and they have this new little thing that's nursing and making them hurt. So most of them have the maternal instinct, but not all of them. So we recommend that you call the office if the placenta has not passed within two hours. Um, we don't consider it a retained placenta up till four hours, but sometimes again there may be a little lag time or some of the mares we know that have had some difficulty, we might even have you come pick up a shot of oxytocin, which is an intramuscular injection which will help kind of contract and pass that placenta. So the foal should get up within an hour. Okay, if your foal is not standing within an hour, if everything's been great but the foal's not up, you, you need to call because something's not quite as, it, as it's been. We like to give them every chance in the world to get up on their own, but if they need a little tail tug to help them and stabilize, that's okay too. But they should be able to stand with no difficulty. Well, maybe a little difficulty. Um, they should nurse within two hours. So invariably what foals are gonna do is they're gonna suckle on everything but the teat before they find the teat. <laughs> and so that's one more good reason to have your stall clean because when these babies are young in those first 24 hours, the way they can absorb that colostrum, that first milk that's high in antibodies, is because their gut is wide open to absorb those large molecules. And some of the other large molecules are little things called bacteria. So we like to wash the mares, have them clean, have their udder clean around their bum afterwards. If you can clean them off a little bit, that's great. So they're not ingesting quite as much as they're going all over the place. <coughs> so it's the one, two, three rule, right? They should stand within an hour, nurse within two hours, and placenta within three hours. Again, I told you it's not really retained until it's four hours, but we don't like you to get there, so we'd like it to get out of there. So if everything is good, you got a normal happy baby on the ground, it's nursing, mom's past her placenta, everybody's happy, then we like to examine those foals and mares at about 12 hours of age. And the reason we wait till that 12 hours is because we do a very simple on-site blood test to check and see if they absorbed enough of those antibodies that we talked about that are so critical to their immune system early on. We have to wait till at least 10 or 12 hours of age before those will be high enough in the blood. So to avoid a second call charge for you or a second visit out that day, we like to, to wait that long. But if any of the other things don't happen, the foal doesn't stand within an hour, the foal doesn't nurse, the placenta is retained, or you think something's not right here, then we really want to see those babies right away. So
So what are we going to do when we come out to look at your mare in foal? Um, we're going to look at mom first. So we want to make sure mom's okay. Sometimes moms bleed. Sometimes they retain their placenta. Sometimes they colic. There's lots of different things that can happen. Sometimes they tear their vaginal vault or all the way through to their rectum when they deliver. So we've got to look at all of those things. We want to make sure that her color's good. There's no evidence of an increased heart rate and bad color because then we'd be a little bit worried about her bleeding. Um, that she's got good mammary development, that she's allowing the foal to nurse. We will get nightmare mommies that don't want a foal and they wonder what this whole little dream thing you had going was because <laughs> they, don't, they don't want a baby. And it's a nightmare because now we've got basically an orphan foal if we can't convince mom that baby's a good, a good thing. So we're gonna take a look at her. Over to your right here is a picture of a placenta as it's passed. You can see it's tied up here. These are the membranes that were around the foal and somebody's tied them in a nice knot as they were kind of hanging through. This over here is the gravid horn or what we call the pregnant horn where baby was. This would be the non-pregnant horn and then the only hole that we should see in this placenta is where the baby busts out. So these are the side of the membranes that was against the baby. The red velvety side there was actually against the uterus and attached by millions of little fingers that hold each other in place that allow that blood supply to go through to that fetus and develop over time. So as we look at this, because you guys have been so astute and you put the placenta in a bucket of water, and if it's a little warm, maybe a towel over the top so the flies aren't eating it. Um, now we're gonna spread it all out and make sure we don't have a lot of holes in it, that one of these horns isn't missing, okay? Sometimes we're missing something. And one of the horns might still be up within the mare. And then we've got more of a problem. We've got to go find it. Either it's somewhere in your shavings or it's still in that mare. And if we leave it in there, she will get very sick. She's going to run fever. She's going to get an infection in her uterus. She may get toxic. There's a lot of bad things that can happen. So we want to check and make sure that the whole placenta is passed. The other thing that we'll pay attention to when we look at this placenta is um, we'll turn it inside out here and look at the red velvety side and see if it's all pretty uniform or are there spots where there's really no attachment, it looks white or is there a spot that looked like there was an infection or is there something else in there? We've, um, we've found little um, twin remnants in placentas before over the years where we've had just a little skeleton that obviously died at a few months of age. So there's all sorts of exciting things can be discovered um, through the placenta, even though it's pretty gross. You guys always wonder what to do with it when we're done, but it is an amazing organ. Um, so examine of the, examination of the foal. This is pretty important, right? Because foals can look fantastic and maybe not quite be as fantastic as we think, and some of those things can pop up during this exam. So of course they're very simple. What is their temperature? What is their heart rate? Um, How's their belly button look? Does they have a hernia? Are their legs straight? Um, very common for foals at delivery to maybe be crooked, way down on their fetlocks, way up where they're tipped over. Those things change pretty quickly early on, but we may need to monitor them, so we need to be aware of them um, early on in the process. Congenital abnormalities, those are things I'm born with a defect, right? Because maybe my heart doesn't sound right. Um, maybe they've got a broken rib during delivery. We always look at their eyes when they're delivered because cataracts can be congenital, meaning babies can actually be born with cataracts in their eyes. And that's probably the most, the highest success rate in, in cataract surgery in horses is, is on neonatal foals, the ones that are actually born with them and don't develop them. Um, scrotal or umbilical hernias, holes in the midline, holes in where their testicles come down through their scrotum. You can have intestine present in there. So there's a lot of things that, that can be there that maybe might, not, excuse me, might not have noticed. Um, and then probably one of the most important things is that immunoglobulin levels or the IgG. Those are those antibodies again. And very simply through a little blood test that we take from that foal, we can check and see if they're a high enough level that we feel um, confident that they're very well protected. The problem is, if those babies are born and they don't have those antibodies, they look great. They look fine till about three, four days of age where they're septic and they've got a massive infection. And now we have went from being able to treat them um, with a plasma transfusion to give them the antibodies to 
changing and having uh, difficulty because now we're hospitalizing an, uh, a foal with a sepsis or an infection and it's a big difference. If we come out and we check these IgG levels at 12 hours and they're low, then our protocol is to give them a plasma transfusion. So it sounds very invasive, but we pop a little catheter in their neck and we've got these great plasma donors that we get plasma from and we give them a bag of plasma and it'll elevate usually their antibodies to where they need to be and then they're well protected. So really, really important. Um, often on these folds, it's a good idea just to run a CBC and chem profile. Just lets us know early on, is the white count normal or is the white count high? Do we actually have some liver problems at delivery? You know, are there some things that we need to kind of look at um, and keep an eye on in the first week or two of life? Um, meconium, which is the first manure, have they passed that? That's that black stuff and you ought to see it kind of pass out within the first couple hours. Um, Often we'll just have you give a um, sodium phosphate fleet enema. Uh, those are the same that we use for people. Just a little enema in the, in the foals bum bum. Just don't stand behind them um, after you give it because they will have a butt on fire for a while and fire out those darts. But we want to get that out early because if we're at 12 hours and that foal hasn't passed its meconium, that's, that can be an issue um, and a serious one. And then, of course, we talk about we want to make sure those navels are dipped as well. So this is just a little bit of parameters, kind of things we've already talked about with gestation length and you know those babies should be able to suckle too. If that baby's still on the ground, you put its, your fingers in its mouth, it should suck on your fingers. It should have a suckle reflux. So that's something you can check even you know, if the foal is up and happy but it's just going all over the place and it doesn't really have its tongue out. You can kind of put your fingers in its mouth and make sure it's able to, to suck on your fingers. It should be able to. Um, so these just kind of go over some baselines with, with heart rate and that. Um, and just for any of you, we are gonna, we're videotaping all this, so you'll be able to see this presentation again if you so desire as your foals getting closer, so you can kind of take a look at these. Um, then we just kind of go over body temperatures. Foals temperatures usually are a little bit higher than the average um, adult horse. So having a temp of 101.5, even 102, I don't get real excited about um, in a foal, newborn foal. Their membranes should be pink. They shouldn't be white. They shouldn't be huffing and puffing. They should look pretty good there. So my rule of thumb, if you think something is wrong, something is wrong until we prove that something's not. They're not an adult. They don't have till morning. We need to look at them. Babies decline rapidly. And I can't tell you the number of times we feel like we've heard well, you know, I thought he was a little off last night. And in the morning they're down and you can't get them up and mom's milk, milk is leaking everywhere and it, it's a nightmare. So rule of thumb on the neonatal foals that if you think something's wrong, let's look at them right away because ours um, <coughs> cause a rapid decline because they need to nurse, they need to eat, they need to be mobile. And if those things change, they can take a rapid, rapid dive. So I just got a little video we made for you here. I figure out how to do it. Ah. Another turning point, a fork stuck in the road. Time grabs you by the wrist, directs you where to go So make the best of this test and don't ask why It's not a question but a lesson learned in time It's something unpredictable, but in the end is right I hope you had the time of your life So take the photographs and still frames in your mind Hanging on a shelf in good health and good time Tattoos and memories and dead skin on trial For what it's worth, it was worth all the while It's something unpredictable, but in the end is right I hope you had the time of your life
unpredictable But in the end it's right I hope you had the time of your life All right, guys. If anybody has any questions, I'm certainly willing to open it up for discussion. I do. Yes. Um, <laughs> She's got her notebook out. I do. Well, I have to write things down. I have to remember. Is there a product that you give a full that's recommended for the first seven days for the bacteria that they can get that causes diarrhea that you would recommend? Um, there's a couple of different ones. Epic would be a, a name if we've had problems with <laughs> diarrhea before. It's, it's based on an egg yolk, actually, okay. and it's shown to help uh, prevent uh, bacterial infections early on, uh, more of diarrheas. Is that something you recommend? Uh, have you had problems with them before or just for? Well, I haven't, but the problem is, is I live quite a distance away from any vet, mm -hmm. and so you can never be prepared. It's certainly not going to hurt them. Okay. You know, it's not like you're giving them a drug that could pro cause okay. problems with their kidneys. That, that, or we have a probiotic called ProBioK. Same thing, you can give it twice a day okay. um, as a probiotic. But Epic is a good one. And is that the or it's oral? Mm -hmm. And is yep. that something we can pick up tomorrow on the way out of town? <laughs> you can pick up the ProBioK. I don't have any of the Epic, okay. Right, okay. Epic right now. Okay, that would be perfect. Yep, okay. absolutely. Let me see. Wait, don't go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know. Well, when you live far from a vet, you actually have to have some kind yes, of preparation. Yes, plan. Yeah. Um, if you have a mare that's kind of displaying uh, signs of maybe having a baby early, mm -hmm. um, and you give her the vaccination because it's you're kind of estimating maybe she's going to be early, mm -hmm. what happens if she's late? Do you revaccinate? Or what's your mm. recommendation on that? So I think if you're six to eight weeks out, you're fine. Okay. If you get any further than that, then. Okay. And then what do you think about, uh, what's your thought on uh, vaccinating the mare at the regular time, like in April, when you would give a regular set of vaccinations? Do you revaccinate? Um, when she's, you mean, so she when falls in February fall. and yep. she, uh, you wouldn't hurt her. I don't think it's necessary. I mean, you could change her schedule a little bit. And okay. just do maybe split the difference. Let's say you vaccinated her in January because she was foaling in February. The next year, I might wait till March, end of February, March. So you're not that late, okay. but um, you you get her covered in a okay. more timely. And do you recommend doing a um, rhinitis, the rhinovitis vaccine, the three shots before? It's another one for I guess. Yeah, five, seven, and nine months. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because that, um, that's a form of herpes virus that can cause abortion in pregnant mares and also cause a, a neonatal form, meaning that the baby can get sick with it as well. Yeah, is that the one with the, diar the baby gets the diarrhea from that? Uh, no, the, that would be a little bit different. So that would be more like a coronavirus type yeah. of thing. Yeah, and there's a shot for that by Fort Dodge. Is that the one you recommend? Mm. It's the opposite. So you're thinking the Pneumabort. That's yes. the. Well, no, the Pneumabort's <laughs> different than this one. That's what I was asking. This is at uh, eight, nine, and ten months, rather than the five, seven, and nine. Hmm. Oh, you'll have to see what you're looking at there. Okay. I don't know if there's actually a coronavirus okay. vaccine. Sometimes we will give, um, if mares have had problems with like a clostridial diarrhea, mm -hmm. sometimes we've actually used the cattle vaccine for clostridium, oh, okay. and that may be what you're looking at. Okay. And then, um, I know, I won't take up everyone's time. <laughs> I've heard of the, like, the mare colic afterwards, like mm -hmm. you talked about. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you can help them with for that purpose? What's yes. your recommendation on that? Right. So you can go ahead and give some banamine, which is an anti-inflammatory, will help with the cramping and the pain. And if we get mares that we're looking at that are crampy post foaling, we'll often do that. Okay. But just remember, we still could have had a Heron or vaginal vault, we could yeah. have a uterine problem. There's a lot of other things that could go on. But yes, we can give some, some banamine. And then the other thing I didn't touch on, sometimes mares have a little bit difficulty passing manure or post fulling, right? They've got a lot of swelling, they're uncomfortable, it's hard. Um, so I get a lot of clients that will give them a little mineral oil bran mash um, to try and help them um, the first couple days after foaling to kind of keep things <coughs> loosened up. You had a question here? Uh huh. Uh, do, do they need to have surgery if a foal shows that it has hernia from birth, or should you wait until a certain amount of time for them to? 
Yeah, so we usually wait a little bit because a lot of those will close up, at least get smaller. And so what we tell people, we usually will tell you it's a three finger hernia or a two finger hernia or whatever, when that's basically how many fingers you can fit in the hole, right? And then we'll have you um, later on as they get a little bit older, kind of mess with that a little bit. Sometimes you can irritate the edges and get those things to close up some. Um, the dangerous ones, let's say we told you it was a two finger hernia and all of a sudden at eight months of age, you, all you had seen is a little bit of a bubble there and all of a sudden you look like you have a water balloon sticking out, that, that can be an emergency because that means all of a sudden that hernia sack got filled with something. And that can be a big problem. But most of the time we hold off and do them, well, you're gonna, if, if they're big enough, we feel like they need a surgical repair, we recommend doing them before you wean or after you wean, not anywhere around that time. You need to separate it a little bit because we don't want those babies too excited and stressed when they're trying to heal in their, in their belly. Teresa. Um, if you have had a problem with a specific disease, it's not uncommon. So in parts of the country that have a lot of rhodococcus, which causes a pneumonia, a lot of those babies will get a, a rhodococcus um, plasma transfusion. Um, but I think as a whole, just to do it, not unless you've had a history of problems on the farm. You know, after we've had um, issues with, with multiple foals, we might make that. Um, election, or if the mayor's always had problems and not had good colostrum, you might look at it that way, or even on an easier side of things, we can tube that baby with colostrum at three, four hours old, rather than, um, you know, actually giving them a plasma transfusion, giving them good, good colostrum, which we can keep on hand. Janelle? Um, I have two questions. Yes. Um, first of all, if the mayor is leaking milk uh -huh. for quite a while prior, and you collect the milk, how do you store it? Um, you can freeze it. It's probably be the safest since you don't know actually when they're going to fall, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it's within a few days, it'd be great, but that's the great unknown. So freezing it like in a double Ziploc baggie would be great. And then one of the things we can do, we can test that colostrum. We've got a little test called Colostral C, and you put a little tube, see if it clots, make sure it's even good uh -huh. because it would be nice for you to be prepared before the baby comes. We want to know that that colostrum's going to be good for, for the baby. So real simple, you could run by with just a little bit of it, and we could test it and make sure it's okay. And is there a product that you can, um, <coughs> talking about just getting them, uh, the infusion, but is there a product you can actually give the foal uh, after it's been born to increase? Uh, do they have that colostrum? Uh-huh. There, there's a couple of them. There's some... Um, we have banked um, colostrum from, from farms that we get from back in Kentucky, although we've had some difficulty getting it the last couple of years, um, some good high quality colostrum, and you can come <coughs> buy that and give it to them. Um, but we've also used an artificial colostrum called Ceramune, um, and you can, you can actually give that to them. And I've had a number of clients, you know, give them half a bottle of Ceramune <coughs> at, at two and four hours or three and six hours, and it would be just a little bit of an extra insurance policy. To get something in them. Pretty expensive. It's not that bad. No, I mean it's. I don't know what it's up to now, but probably 110 or something for a bottle. The colostrum is ridiculously expensive from the farms in Kentucky, <coughs> and I think maybe just because of the decreased breeding numbers over the last few years and the economic decline, we can't get it as easily. So. But on the other farms, after 18, 24 hours of life, they're going to Sure. Um, and especially the bones. Uh huh. Um, say the bull passes in the pony is a pretty good amount. You still recommend just giving it as an extra insurance policy? And if so, at, at what point should you say? Um, I don't know that I routinely um, recommend it if they're passing meconium and they're happy. Um, you probably wouldn't hurt giving them a little bit. And I know a lot of times, let's say it's the middle of the night and it's You've been watching for two hours and they haven't passed anything and they're nursing and everything else is happy. A lot of those, I say, give them the enema so you can watch them go to the bathroom and you can go to bed, um, you know, to make sure everything's okay. And the biggest thing with like a, a fleet enema or a sodium phosphate enema is we wouldn't want to give 
more than two in a day, let's say we were having problems, which I know we would see the foal anyways, but um, you know, you could definitely, if he's past meconium, in an hour or so you could give it. There's no right or wrong magic enema hour, really. And um, do you recommend deworming the mare uh, any time before foaling and after foaling? Yeah, a, a month out and on day one with, a, with an ivermectin product. <coughs> okay, so before and then day one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, you bet. You bet. Yes. If it's a stall, you're putting straw and getting ready for the baby. Is there something you should put in the stall with? Wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, you can use a, a dilute chlorhex or a dilute Clorox bleach. You know, like 30 parts water to one part Clorox, um, and just wipe down the walls. Uh, you don't want to actually spray or use pressure sprayers or all that because then you just aerosolize all the bacteria. But just take them. You want to make sure all the organic matter so you don't want any poop on the walls or dirt because it'll still live in that. But get all that washed off with soap and water and then you can wash it off with just a little bit of dilute bleach. And the no sound was the one to four? And you, four to one. Or four to one. Mm -hmm. No sounds four or water one? No. Yeah. Water's water, four. Water. Yeah. Still water, right? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Anybody? Yeah. Isn't that worming again uh, a month before and, and on day one. Yeah. Yep. What would you use for that? Ivermectin usually. <coughs> so when a, you see the milk coming out. Do you, I mean, you said it catches the colostrum. Yeah, you know, I know you don't run around with a tin cup or something. I mean, <laughs> what's the method for that? And how much do you know that you need to get? We'd love to have um, four to six ounces uh -huh. to get in that baby. And, you know, I would really truly just catch it in whatever you got to uh -huh. catch it in. I'd go grab a little. Tupperware or something, and just it's all in catch it. Now, yeah, you don't want to. Uh, some mares will really stream. I mean, some of them will sit there and get a puddle. You know, the mares that are occasionally leaking a little bit, I don't worry as much uh -huh. about. Um, but the ones that are sitting there making a puddle, mm -hmm. then that's a, that's a problem. Um, so I'll usually just do Tupperware or something. I don't recommend milking them. Obviously, you want to leave what you can in there, and you're going to stimulate more oxytocin release if you try and milk them. Um, so you can just catch it in what you can and then put it in a Ziploc freezer bag. And then for the cleaning of the teeth and the bag mm -hmm. right after birth, is there just soap and water? Or? Um, probably again, your little bit of Novasan in water. Um, but soap and water getting the big organic matter off is, is a oh, good okay. thing too. And probably, you know, cleaning them before and then what you can. You don't want to get in there and push the foal off and clean their teats, but if you can and everybody's kind of taking babies over here, you can clean her off a little bit. Anybody else? Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. um, we've got two rescuers that we took from the Fallon Roundup from the reservation that are you might know, just make sure there's like all, you know, certified with all the data this year. Um, any particular precautions to look for since they're under the age of three? Um, again, they're missing, so they might not look quite much. And, and I think it's a little harder on the younger ones to bond, so to make sure that they, you know, bond and allow that fold to nurse. Are they nice to handle? They are. They're pretty, you know, one's halter broke so far, and then one's right around the corner being halter broke. Very, very up and close and friendly now. You know, they're a lot calmer than when we first brought them home. Um, we put them together with our broke mares so that they've got a lot more people interaction safe for them. Um, so I'm not terribly worried about them being like unhandled by that point. Um, That's good because you got to be able to help them. I had a I had a nightmare one last spring, and uh, Heather, my our receptionist, came in and she said, Dr. Schur. We've got a, a rescue mare that um, they can't get a halter on that's got a dystocia and her water broke an hour ago. And I'm like, great. <laughs> this sounds like fun. So I showed up and I, I was trying to help them get on the mare because they couldn't get a halter on it or a rope on it or anything. And it was in this outside pen and it was running around. I said, well, we need to get a rope on it. I, well, we don't have a rope. so. They, or no, they did have a rope. So they handed me the rope. 
I'm like, great. So <laughs> the mare would lay down and press and press and press, and it had, I think, one leg, and then I could see an ear, right? And it didn't look good, and I couldn't get near her, and she'd get up, and she'd run around and fire and kick and run around, and she'd lay down and try and try and try, and she couldn't do anything. I thought, oh, this is good. This is not going to be good. And so I said, well, let's get her into that pen because maybe I can at least get some sedation in her and get a rope on her and get some sedation in her and see if I can help the poor girl. And so as I was running her in the pen, I had my rope and I'm just swinging my rope like this, right? And she goes in the pen, they slam the door and she goes, wham, wham, wham. I'm bucking as high as she can. I'm going, oh my God, this is not good. She came down and I kid you not, Two legs and a head. <laughs> I'm like, look at that. I'm superwoman. <laughs> and she laid down. And they said, what do we do now? I'm like, I think we're going to watch her have a baby. <laughs> and God hopes she passes that placenta with no problem. <laughs> she did fine. But oh my God. So we decided after that we might put little bucket straps on all the distoches and see if they can reposition them on their own. <laughs> And that was right after I was recovering from a head injury last spring. So it was, it was, really, a, it was really a good time. But. So it's always an adventure in this profession. <coughs> yes, Dr. John. So one other thing, especially these maiden mares that you know really well, and they're and everything else, they can get quite aggressive with the pole on the ground for a day or two. So you gotta kind of watch what you're doing around them. They'll reach and fight you. I'm not sure it kicked you. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there an ideal time to uh, say for breeding uh, as opposed to, you know, you were talking about flies? Mm -hmm. So our biggest risk with breeding is the heat. Um, so if we get into June, we're starting to talk with clients about, mm, you know, we're going to have a late May baby. Uh, this could be a real problem. Um, I can tell you of the babies that I've had born in July and August, more get hospitalized than not hospitalized. And it's because they're just so hot, they can't thermoregulate, we end up having to run them fluids. You know, it's a tough deal to have babies born in 110 degrees. So that's our biggest challenge. And we could have a baby born today, it's perfect, right? It's January, and in most parts of the country you wouldn't want a baby in January because it's so darn cold. But our cold is not usually an adversity. It's more of, of the heat side of things. So um, spring babies or fall, late fall babies are still OK. But with universal birthdays, most people don't want to do that. Are you wanting to get them born before the flies really start? Ideally, that'd be perfect. I don't worry as much about the flies as I do about the heat, though. So. So um, in our neck of the woods, it gets rather cold. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a baby that's born, and it's going to probably be when it's really cold. Um, if the baby gets born on a night that's, you know, four degrees, can we, do you, should you put a blanket on it? Or, Absolutely. OK, a full blanket. Yep. And how long should you keep that on, on the baby? I mean, because you know sometimes the days will only be, the high will be 28. And the so I think after the first couple of weeks of life, they'll oh. be pretty thermoregulated. Okay. And in a pinch, if you got one born, like the sweatshirt that you have on okay. works perfect, right? Okay. You can put their little legs in yeah. the in the arms and uh, zip up yeah. over their back. It works really good. And We've you done can it. just leave that on them? Yeah, absolutely. Now, what temperature would you take that blanket off? Because I mean, here's the thing, you know, you, I mean, where we live, you'll, you may have a day that's 32, but the wind's blowing, and that means it's, you know, it could be 12. Yeah, I'd like to see it be in the 40s. I don't know okay. that there's actually a real magic number okay. in those. I just want to make sure that it, can, it can regulate its body temperature in order to adapt. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, um, I was just going to touch on a few other things. Um, Lisa was nice enough to put out some of our, our new equipment. This little deal right here that I'm standing on is something uh, called a TheraPlate. It has nothing to do with foaling. Um, but it is a vibration table, and I invite anybody that wants to come up and stand on it um, afterwards to kind of get a feel of what it is. And we're really excited about it. It's not the all fix all, but it's used in a lot of performance horses. Uh, almost like a little massage. I, I, I don't buy into things very easily, but when I had a conversation with this gentleman about this unit, I stood on it for 15 minutes during the conversation. And when I walked away, I was like, whoo, 
feel like I've been to the spa. You know, you do. You feel pretty good. So we've also, um, this last week, had a post-operative colic surgery that unfortunately has laminitis. We used it on her. She would just about jump on it every day. I mean, she, she really liked it. Um, so uh, a lot of different things. The other thing I'm really excited about trying it on is some of our colics because some of those impactions that need to move and maybe don't move as much and stand on this thing and it'll jiggle them up a little bit. So we're kind of in the, in the early phases of it as far as in the veterinary field and trying to do a little bit of our own uh, research to see what it's going to help us the most about. We do know that it increases circulation and it definitely relaxes the muscles and that. So that's what this is and like I said, you're all welcome to jump up here on it if you want afterwards. We'll fire it up and let you feel how it feels. Um, over here to my left is, is something called an equipulse unit. Um, and it's electromagnetic um, treatment. Uh, if you feel it, it feels almost like a little static, big static electricity on your back. Um, and we're really excited about using it on some of our sacroiliac problems in horses up in their pelvis, um, sore muscles, and use it on distal limbs, and it's good for kind of a temporary pain relief too. It's not, again, the almighty fix-all, but uh, changes a little bit of the electrical co-occurrence amongst the muscle, almost like an acupuncture would, um, without the needles. So that's what that little unit is there. Um, and then I think the girls have set out some of our little ice bo boots. We're carrying some of those ice horse products now too, um, which are really nice, very affordable. Um, they've got the little gel inserts that you can put in your freezer. They're also coming out with a heat insert that we can use um, as well. And then there's some soft ride boots next to there. So Certainly willing to entertain any questions as you guys kind of mull through here on your way out. Um, and if you want to come jump up on the TheraPlate, I'll fire it up for you. So. Yeah.